All right, thanks, Brandon. And hopefully everyone is seeing my screen. Um, so I'm going to just give you a little bit of background on how we got to where we are through the Mid Atlantic Council's ecosystem approach to fishery management. And uh, this has been a group project that uh, myself and Garrett DePiper at the Northeast Fishery Science Center have been working on with Brandon, along with Richard Seagraves, who was in uh, Brandon's position on the council staff before, and lots of other people. So um, this is really a group product and something that's been in progress for quite a while. So. The Mid Atlantic Council did uh, a visioning project back in something like 2011. That was before I even worked here. And it, in looking across all of their stakeholders, they found that there was a really diverse set of stakeholders that all agreed that an ecosystem approach was necessary. Not everyone agreed what the ecosystem approach should look like, but everyone agreed that it was necessary. So developing and implementing this approach, um, it has been done in collaboration and continues to be done in collaboration. This is a work in progress between managers, stakeholders, scientists, lots of other people. So in this really brief talk, I'm gonna to try to give you an overview of what the Mid-Atlantic Council's ecosystem approach looks like. It's a process. Um, and the first two steps in the process that have already been taken, which is first an indicator-based risk assessment, and I'll explain that in a moment. And then also some conceptual modeling that was done over the last year that's forming the basis for the management strategy evaluation. So over here on the right hand side of the slide, we have our integrated ecosystem assessment loop. And all this really shows you is that integrated ecosystem assessment is a process um, and it has several steps, but they're iterative and you can go through it really in any order. So you would start off by defining what your goals are, which is going to sound familiar after the end of this um, whole workshop. Then uh, in the integrated ecosystem assessment, you would develop some indicators that are tied to your goals or reflect what's going on with your goals and targets. You would assess the ecosystem based on the indicators, analyze uncertainty and risk, evaluate different strategies to manage the uncertainty and risk, and then implement actions, monitor the indicators, evaluate and assess the outcomes, et cetera. So this is sort of a theoretical process that's been developed um, by people in the US and other places to, to look at ecosystem approaches. The Mid-Atlantic Council has adapted this to their own um, process here. And so what it, it's, a, it's basically the, a similar idea where you first want to prioritize because there's a lot of different things you could look at in the ecosystem and you don't want to try to take them all on at once. Um, then you would refine what you're going to what you want to do about the high priority items and then you would analyze those items then you would implement and monitor and circle back. So you can see it's a lot of the same pieces as integrated ecosystem assessment. And the tools that the council is using in this process are first risk assessment. So you do your risk assessment to see what your highest risk interactions are in the ecosystem or among fisheries or species. And those are the ones that would get priority. After doing the risk assessment, which is updated every year, and again, I'll give an example of that, um, you could refine your questions. So you have a risk, but what is it about the risk that you're really worried about? What is the key question? What information is necessary? And to address this, the tool is a conceptual model. And so it's really just kind of a visual roadmap to how the pieces might fit together and where the information is and what the key question is that you want to answer. Once you have the key question and you know what information you have and what the important connections are, then you can analyze. And so that's the step that we're starting on now. It's called management strategy evaluation. And you'll, the next presentation will tell you a little bit more about that process. But the main idea is to have a set of alternative strategies and figure out which one might be best going to achieve the council's goals in managing this risk and um, for these ecosystem interactions. So then after that, if the council chooses to, they can implement one of these strategies and monitor how that's working and then work their way back through the loop again. So um, the way this actually unfolded has been iterative. And so that's another important thing to remember as you go through the MSE process. It's not like you only get one chance. There's lots of opportunities for feedback and the ideas will evolve over time. So for example, the very first step in the process, the risk assessment was first um, put together, kind of an example was put together by council staff and scientists to say, okay, what if we took all of the council's managed species, which are here in the rows of this table, you can see the surf clam and ocean quahog, summer flounder, scup and black sea bass, et cetera. And the blue boxes are just the fishery management plans. And if you look across those, what different types of risks might you have? Well, you would have whether they're um, a subject to overfishing, is the fishing mortality rate too high? Is the biomass below the target? 
or below the limit? Um, is the assessment working in a good way? Is there good data for it? Are there discard concerns, food web concerns? Are there climate concerns or concerns about distribution shifts or concerns about allocation or habitat? So this was just the first example. And as you can see, you can sort of fill it in with um, red being higher risk and green being lower risk. And this was, again, just an example, not based on a big quantitative analysis. But to show that, hey, you might kind of back up and squint and say, wow, this FMP with summer flounder and skep and black sea bass, and it tends to have a little bit more red high risk cells than the rest of the FMP species. And so, and again, the council's ecosystem approach is still based on the individual species and the fishery management plans. So there isn't any plan to get rid of those. Everything's still operating the same way as we do, but it's just trying to make these linkages between them. So that was the first step, but then it went to the council and the council said, hey, you know, there's there's kind of more things that we're concerned about there. And so with public in input, as well as the council and the um, advisory panels, several more elements came into the analysis. So these are called risk elements, um, all of these things across the top here, and more were added. So for instance, we're, we have economic concerns, things like commercial revenue, recreational angler days and trips, commercial fishery resilience um, in several different uh, ways of looking at it, revenue diversity, shoreside support businesses. Also, there's concerns about social risks, fleet resilience, the risks to fishing communities and food production, commercial and recreational seafood production. And so all those were added to the risk assessment based on this iterative public input. And the other thing that was added were risk elements for management. So management control, interactions between different um, species and different entities, management groups, other ocean uses, regulatory complexity, discards and allocation were all added as risk elements. So how does the council go through and analyze these? Well, there's different indicators you can tie to these elements. Like we saw, you can have your goals and you tie indicators to them in ecosystem assessment. And so that's exactly what the council did. So for instance, here's one example, the risk assessment indicator and the ranking criteria for commercial revenue. So the risk element is commercial revenue. Revenue is a proxy for commercial profits because we don't have the data on profits. And the council went through and determined these risk levels from low to low and moderate to moderate to high or to high and defined what those would look like with respect to this indicator. So this indicator is just showing you in black the total revenue generated in the mid-Atlantic region from all species combined. And in red is the revenue from Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council managed species combined in the Mid-Atlantic. And this is from about the mid 80s up and through 2019. And so you can see that there's this long-term downward trend, especially in this red line, that's what the purple line means. Whereas the total revenue has been going up and then is kind of coming back down again. So um, this one was ranked moderate to high because it has this significant long-term decrease in revenue. And so we went through and the whole um, risk assessment was done in this way, looking at the indicators and the different risk criteria that the council had defined. And you can get this great big table of the different risks. But now it looks like a lot, but there's actually, this is a really um, convenient way to look across all the species and all the risks. And that's exactly what the council did. So this is the 2021 updated risk table that the council is going to get next week. So you're getting a sneak preview. Um, but what the council did in 2018 was went back and looked across all the species. And for instance, summer flounder had a few higher risks here with respect to status at that time before the new assessment was done. And it also has some higher risks over here with respect to estuarine habitat and climate distribution shifts. And also over here, things like discards and allocation and regulatory complexity, et cetera, all affect the summer flounder fishery, as well as some of these ecosystem level elements like food production and um, recreational value. And so what the council did was looked across this and selected summer flounder as one of the highest risk fisheries. And so then assembled a working group of different scientists and managers and to come together and figure out how all these risks for summer flounder interacted with each other. And that step was defining the conceptual model, which you will see in the next slide. So that was step two. You saw the risk assessment. Now you're going to see the conceptual model. And from that conceptual model, the council asked to the working group to draft questions that could be pursued about the, using the conceptual model as sort of a roadmap. And so after this was presented in December 2019, the council decided to proceed with management strategy evaluation using the information from the conceptual model, which was also based on the risk assessment. And the topic was, of course, addressing recreational fishery discards, 
from this ecosystem approach framework. And so the next slide is the actual conceptual model, which looks a bit intimidating, but it's intended to be interactive. So what you can do is this is all the risks and how they relate to each other. Right. So you can start to look at something like, well, if I'm interested in recreational value, I can highlight recreational value and I can see all the things that affect it. For instance, fluke SSB is spawning stock biomass. Distributional shift is where the population is moving along the coast. Regulatory complexity affects it. Management control, allocation, total landings, total discards, shifts in preferences for species and offshore wind, economic drivers. All of these things affect recreational value. Similarly, you can go through and see what's connected to discards, and it's also things in purple, which relate to the, the fish themselves, the population, things in green, which relate to management, okay. things in gray reflect fisheries, etc. And so habitat quality and things like that are all over here and can connect up. And this is really just a roadmap to say, what things should we consider in the analysis? We won't need to use all of them. But it's just a checklist to make sure that we haven't missed anything that might connect to summer flounder. And so the council had a list of about 10 questions and selected the following one um, in December 2019. So it's basically evaluate the biological and economic benefits of minimizing summer flounder discards and converting discards into landings in the recreational sector and identify management strategies to effectively realize these benefits. And so this, of course, was an opportunity to align the council's ecosystem approach to fishery management work with something they're already doing in the council process. Um, this is an important question that has been on people's minds for quite a while. And there's quite a bit of a few management challenges to address, and it's been raised by many people over time. And so, again, it, even though it's focused on discards, it is still um, solidly within the ecosystem approach to fishery management because it's linked to management, the stock, the science, fishing fleets and benefits, and, and, and indirectly also to things like habitat, et cetera, depending on the direction that we take the analysis. So the next step is management strategy evaluation, and that's where we are now. So you were here. Thank you for coming. This is a great opportunity for you to participate and shape the analysis, which hasn't been started yet. And so again, just like the other parts of the process, this is going to be an iterative process with lots of feedback between the scientists and the managers and the stakeholders. And so now that we are here, um, we're going to get an introduction to the management strategy evaluation process. So I will turn this over to um, I'll turn it back to Brandon. So there's lots of links here and, and people are welcome to have these slides uh, later. Thanks very much for your attention. Stop sharing. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. So next, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan Cummings, and he's going to give an overview of management strategy evaluation. I'm going to give you the ball, Jonathan. You got the slides or the notes page? Also have the notes page. Okay, thank you. So I'm Jonathan Cummings and my role in this is basically to help facilitate the process and be a kind of neutral assistant for everybody. So that's my role here. And what I'm gonna start with here today is talking about what management strategy evaluation is and kind of how that process works. So to start with some defining terminology, the way that I like to define it is as a structured collaborative process to provide decision support via an evaluation of management actions in terms of management objectives. That's one of many ways it's defined. Um, another definition that I think is very helpful for this sort of framework for supporting decisions comes from Ralph Keeney, who's kind of a legend in the decision science community who calls these sort of decision processes a formal application of common sense for situations that are too complex for the informal use of common sense. And I hope you'll see that basically this process is to take the steps we kind of naturally follow if we took the time to lay out what the steps should be and 
to lay them out and do them one at a time to help make the complex things a bit less complex and easier to talk about one at a time. So the roadmap for how we actually kind of move through the process is first stakeholders and managers and interested parties get together and we get from that those parties what it is that they want to achieve and how they want to achieve that. And that information is used to help produce the product that scientists make, basically a virtual reality simulation of the system. So they make some model of the system to help predict what will happen when various actions are taken. And there's a lot of back and forth between stakeholders and managers here and scientists in order to get that simulation set up in such a way that it predicts what is of interest to the stakeholders and managers. And from that simulation, some outputs are produced in terms of what management actions would perform well or not, and the trade offs between the metrics used to assess that performance. And again, there needs to be a lot of back and forth there to review those results and see if there's things that don't make sense or parts of the system that weren't included that were expected, what have you. So at that stage, again, there's some review and update of the simulation. And once that's complete and everybody's ready to move forward, then the results are presented to managers so that an action can be selected and implemented. Now, that's kind of once through the process, but the intent with these processes is not that it's done and you never revisit it necessarily. So once you're finished, you have the system, there's more learning about the system that occurs, preferences change, regulation, dynamics or governance changes, anything that kind of changes the way the system works or how the structure was set up, it can be iterated and completed again to revise as necessary. That's kind of the nuts and bolts of the order of procedures. Um, but I want to go into a little bit of detail about the steps in the process in terms of how we participate and what's kind of provided at those, each of those stages. And I think a useful analogy for this is the idea of a painter painting a picture where we're all kind of creating a picture together of what it is that we want to achieve and the outcomes that we might expect. And the first step, if you're gonna paint a picture, is to determine what's gonna be in your frame, what is gonna be painted and what's gonna be outside the realm of what you consider. And you might say, okay, I'm gonna paint a picture of a nice little hilltop homestead. That might be the frame of what you consider. And therefore the management actions extending the analogy would be what are you going to do on the top of that hill to create a nice homestead or the decision frame might be you're going to paint a picture of a whole landscape and extending the analogy how are you going to manage that whole landscape so really the first step in management strategy evaluations and into decision processes is to determine what the decision frame is, what's within your picture. And typically the way that you state that and communicate it is with a decision statement that says something like, decide who, what, when, where, why, that you're gonna make a decision about. And defining the geographic, legal, budget, time, or other constraints that apply, and often kind of what the main, um, keys are and what triggered why it's a particular problem. We already have kind of a, a working decision frame for this problem that's come out of the previous uh, ecosystem assessment methodology that Sarah just presented. I've adapted the wording just a little bit to put it in kind of common decision statement terminology and modified it a bit based upon responses to the scoping questionnaire. So kind of the, what we're working from at the moment is decide what regulatory changes to make for the summer flounder recreational fishery, which is minimizing discarding or converting discards to landings, maximize the biological and economic benefits to the fishery while accounting for trade-offs between these benefits. 
So again, that's where we are now, but kind of the first part of tonight and the first part of our larger process will be to revive this, this as necessary if needed. And the reason to get the decision frame right from the beginning is kind of encapsulated by this anonymous quote saying, there's never enough time to do it right, but always enough time to do it over. So we try to minimize the number of times things need to be done over, getting the decision frame right from the beginning can help move through the process and focus on the uh, key aspects of the decision. Once you know kind of what the scope is, you can select your values and elicit the values for what's applicable. So what on the landscape or that homestead area that you're concerned with that's in your decision frame, do you value? Those are your objectives, the things that you want to achieve, the things that you want. And in this particular case, there might be things like, I want a successful trip. That's kind of a, a fundamental type objective, an objective that you want because that's the overarching thing that you're trying to achieve from the system. Or you might say something like, I want to catch for trip, which could be more of a means objective, a means to achieving that fundamental successful trip objective. And often we'll elicit a combination of these and work towards quantifiable objectives so that we can develop metrics or ways to measure the objectives. So there'll be some quantitative measure of our achievement that's used to compare the performance of alternative management actions. So the kind of end goal of the objective stage is to set up a list of objectives, five in this hypothetical case, and how they be measured with some hypothetical examples there. Once you've got your objectives, the next thing to say is, and to ask is, how can we achieve those objectives? What will we actually do? What actions will we take or what alternatives we can, will we consider in order to achieve them? So will be being the possible management actions to evaluate in our simulation of the system and asking what should management do to achieve your objectives is one way to get towards those alternatives. You want to be as creative and expansive at this stage of the process as you can, because if an alternative is not proposed and evaluated in the analysis, then it's not going to be selected. Um, so anything that's left out at this stage would limit the um, ability to achieve objectives. So we try to be expansive here. Some examples that have come out so far are around slot limits, lower size limits, and sharing best practices to reduce mortality. And we'll be asking for your additional thoughts on alternatives as we work through the evening in the process as well. And then the way that you combine alternatives and objectives to decide what to do is kind of shown here in this consequence table that you can kind of think of as a paint by numbers sort of layout where you predict for each alternative how well it will do for the metrics that you've provided for each of the objectives that you've offered. So once those predictions are made, you can get some sort of um, image or paint by numbers solution about what each alternative will do in terms of your objectives and select the one that produces the best image. Now, how does that prediction step take place? You know, we use sort of analogous to virtual reality or flight simulation simulator type approaches to rather than trying to build a model of reality of say this stealth bomber shown on the left here, we build some sort of toy models or simulations of the reality so that we can play out some what if scenarios of what would happen under the various actions that we're proposing without sort of the real world risk. So that should our toy model crash and burn, we're just losing the toy model case, and we haven't actually modified the real world along the way. So we can play out our what if scenarios with these toy models and select the best toy model to apply and actually implement. And the way this works more specifically for fisheries is we have what's termed an operating model. That's our model airplane of the system that captures how the biology and the ecosystem works and how the fishery and the economics play out. And often we have, we 
simulate some sort of data collection process around that as well. So that we know what information management would have when they're making a decision. And then we have a management procedure portion of the model that says, okay, given we have this particular data and the regulations that we've selected to apply in our scenario, what will that do to the system? And so there's a feedback loop there through time. And we monitor our airplane and see what happens to it in terms of the metrics that we developed previously that come from your objectives and compare the performance across the different management procedures to select the one that has the best outcomes in terms of our metrics. So how do you participate in this process? Well, your input on management actions and simulation features is what supplies the design elements of the model. So the models that come out of the process should be recognizable based upon the objectives and the alternatives that you provide. And these meetings are an opportunity to express that input and to help define the management that what management ought to achieve. And again, before any analysis or decisions have been made. So tonight and from core group that participates in future workshops, we'll be asking explicitly what you value and how you want to achieve that. So what is success to you? What is this, what does success look like? Your answers aren't binding. They're just a starting point to identify management actions that may help achieve your wish list. And we ask and expect the need for repetition through the process and patience on, from all participants from our end and the modeling end around determining what, how to meet your requests for input and vice versa, patients with the modelers as they develop the model. Some expectations, um, selection of management actions can entail so I'm finding a best or optimal action, so picking the best from a set, but often that's difficult. Uh, success can be, success as everyone defined it may not be achievable. That could be due to the fact that definitions of success may differ, or you may value trade-offs differently. So one person might value particular objectives more than someone else. So some approaches to that are to ask what actions are unacceptable and eliminate any obviously bad options. That's sometimes the easiest approach. And another option at times is to ask if there's an acceptable management action or kind of a satisfactory option given compromises and across the trade-offs that occur. So an expectation of all this is that this, the decision may still be difficult or contentious. It's not sort of a necessarily going to solve all problems, but it does help. It helps to lay out what everyone's thinking in a clear way that can be documented and be transparent and account for the full breadth of input. So hopefully using this process and our paint by numbers picture, we'll be able to come out with this with sort of a, a clearer, nice view of, of Tuscany or in this case of the summer flounder fishery. So that's kind of where we're going um, and what will come later on this evening. Thanks.